We continue our lectures in text analysis. The topic of lecture 6 is grammatical tools for the analysis of text cohesion. In linguistic literature, cohesion is defined as the use of explicit linguistic devices to signal relations within a text or a sentence. It concerns the ways in which the components of the surface text, that is, the actual words we hear or see, are mutually connected within a sequence. Cohesion implies the links that hold a text together and give it meaning. When we speak of right, we don't normally confine ourselves to single phases of sentences. We string these together to make a connected sequence. And there are words in our language that are particularly designed to enable us to do that. Consider, for example, the piece of writing from McCarthy. One day, a lady came into our street. She had a brightly colored bonnet which seemed out of place there. It had three feathers and a broad blue ribbon which fluttered gaily in the breeze. There are a number of phrases and words here which indicate that all the sentences belong to the same little story. In the second sentence, for instance, the word she clearly refers back to the phrase a lady. Similarly, the lexeme there looks back to our street and is only comprehensible because of that link. In both the second and the third sentences, the word which relates to the much longer phrases, a brightly colored bonnet and a broad blue ribbon, respectively. And in each case, it enables the grafting of a second clause onto the main one. These words ensure that sentences are cohesive and form a recognizable text. While analyzing a cohesive means of language, we would refer to Halliday and Hassan's work Cohesion in English, which is regarded to be the most influential account of this textual phenomenon. There are two main types of cohesion. Grammatical and lexical. Halliday and Hassan identify five general categories of cohesive devices that create or signal coherence in text. They are reference, including coreference, ellipsis, substitution, conjunction, and lexical cohesion. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines reference as a relation between expressions and what the speakers use these expressions to talk about. In the assertion, George Bush is Republican, the proper name George Bush refers to an individual, particular individual, an individual about whom the speaker is going to inform something. The general questions concerning reference are How do words refer? What is the mechanism of reference? Grammatical cohesion of the text is mainly achieved through coreference, that is, the relationship between lingual signs designating the same entity in the world of the text. Coreferential items in English include personal pronouns he, she, it, they, demonstratives this, that, these, those, the definite articles, and items like such a. The opening lines of a famous English novel, Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, show different types of reference at work. I'll read this text. The schoolmaster was leaving the school, the village. 
and everybody seemed sorry. The miller at Crescombe lent him this small white tilted cart and horse to carry his goods to the city of his destination, about twenty miles off, such a vehicle proving quite a sufficient size for the departing teacher's effects. In this microtext, the Italy-sized items refer. For the text to be coherent, we assume that him, in this sentence, lent him the white tilted card as the schoolmaster introduced earlier. Likewise, his destination is the schoolmaster's destination. Reference for the pronouns him and his can be confirmed by looking back in the text. The phrase such as also links back to the card in the previous sentence. The novel opens with the schoolmaster leaving the village. The use of the definite article implies the questions. Which schoolmaster? Which village? On the previous page of the novel, the two words at Mary Green stand alone. So we reasonably assume that Mary Green is the name of the village and that the character is the schoolmaster of that village. We are using more than just the text here to establish reference. The author expects us to share the world with him independent of the text with typical villages and their population, including everybody, their schoolmasters, Millers, etc. Linguists point out that cohesion can be achieved through the use of the following coreferential devices. Looking back, backward, that is anaphoric reference, looking forward, that's cataphoric reference, and looking outward, that is exophoric reference. Anaphoric reference is the most common type of reference used subconsciously in everyday conversation and writing. It occurs when the writer refers back to someone or something that has been previously identified in order to avoid repetition and be more compact. In Greek, the word anaphorin had the meaning to carry back, to refer. It is known that human mind is rather limited in its capacity to store surface materials long enough to work on them. Anaphoric use of pronouns shorten and simplify the surface text without any difficulties for the reader. For example, there was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children she did not know what to do. In this well-known children's rhyme, the pronoun she makes it unnecessary to keep saying the old woman who lived in a shoe, the old woman, or even the woman. Usually, items such as he and him, she and her, or then then, can be decoded without major difficulty, whereas other items, such as it, this, and that, may be more troublesome because of their ability to refer to longer stretches of text. Halliday and Hassan provide the following example. It rained and dried for two weeks. The basement flooded and everything was under the water. It spoiled all our calculations. Here, the pronoun it seems to mean the events of two weeks, or the fact that it rained and flooded. That is, the situation as a whole, rather than one specified entity in that situation. Matters become more complicated when we look at this and that in written texts. McCarthy compares two texts to illustrate the functional semantic peculiarities 
of these pronouns. I'll read them the first text. You may prefer to vent your tumble dryer permanently through a non opening window. This is not quite as neat since the flexible hose remains visible. But it does save knocking a hole in the wall. Now the second text. Only a handful of satellite orbits are known to be changing. Such changes are usually subtle and can be detected only by long-term observations. One exception is the orbit of Neptune's large moon Triton, which is shrinking quite rapidly. That is, because it circles Neptune in the direction opposite the plan to the planet's revolution, generating strong gravitational friction. These are examples which abound in the same choices of it, this and that. Surprisingly, conventional grammars do not give satisfactory descriptions of such usage. Discourse analysts and text linguists have touched upon this problem and made very interesting observations that have a certain amount in common. They can be summed up in this way. The pronoun it cannot be used to refer back to an entity unless it is already the focus of attention. That is, the pronoun it cannot introduce an entity into the text for the first time. Different from it, the word this has a dual function in a text. First, it can perform anaphoric reference as in the first example where this refers to the situation of venting a tumble dryer permanently through a non-opening window. And the second, it can also introduce an entity into the text for the first time, placing it into the focus of attention. For instance, this introduction is fine, it is brief and precise. As for the word that, it can be used to refer a cross key of attention, pushing a proposition out of a central focus and marginalizing it in some way. Anaphora is the most common directionality for coreference since the identity of the conceptual content which is kept current is made plain in advance. Cataphoric reference is the reverse of anaphoric reference and is relatively straightforward. It occurs when the reader is introduced to someone or something as an abstract entity until it is identified by a corrifering expression later. Halliday and Hassan define cataphora as the use of the proform before corrifering expression. It creates a temporarily empty position of a lingual sign until the required content is supplied. These colors indicate that such a mechanism would work best if the distance between the proform and the coriferent expression is kept within limits. For instance, inside the boundaries of a single sentence. They provide the following example. I don't know if he is serious, but my roommate wants to walk a tightrope over at Niagara Falls. In this example, the cataphoric use of the pronoun him makes the speech dramatic and more expressive. Sometimes a pronoun may look ahead to the entire event rather than an individual object. For instance, in this sentence, I would never have believed it they have accepted the whole scheme. The pronoun it refers cataphorically to the event of accepting the scheme. Cataphoric 
preference is less common in, than anaphoric, but in written text it can be used for dramatic or stylistic effect as well as for such pragmatic purpose as to intensify the reader's interest stimulating him or her to get the necessary information for filling up the gap created by the proffer. In new stories and literature, examples of cataphoric use of proforms are often found in the opening sentences of the text. The initial use of cataphoric reference is considered as the manifestation of the author's communicative strategy to engage and hold the reader's attention with a read-on and find-out message. McCarthy substantiates this statement with the following text which represents a newspaper article. I'll read this text. She claims Leo Tolstoy as a distant cousin. Her grandfather was Alexei Tolstoy, the famous Red Count, who sided with Lenin's revolutionaries. Now, Tatiana Tolstoy has put pen to paper in her case to demonstrate that someone from the family can write compactly. In her stories of 10 to 12 typewritten pages, I somehow try to show the whole life of a person from birth to death, she says. We can't establish who she is until the second sentence, in which co-referential proper name identifies the target person as Tatiana Tolstaya, the granddaughter of Alexei Tolstoy, the Red Count who sided with Lenin's revolutionaries. Forward-looking or cataphoric reference of this kind often involve pronouns, but it can involve other referent items too, among them the definite article. For instance, the trip would hardly have been noteworthy, except the man who made it. In mid-July, a powerful American financier flew to Mexico City for a series of talks with high-level government officials, including President Miguel de la Madre and his finance minister. It should be noted that both examples of cataphoric reference are taken from the same issue of Newsweeks, which underlines the most characteristic function of this phenomenon. It is pragmatic by nature and has dual function as it not only reflects the author's communicative strategy to intensify the text receiver's reading activity, but makes the speech more expressive and stylistically marked as well. The third type of co-referential device, devices is exophora, which is a reference to assumed shared words outside the text. In Greek, exon had the meaning of outside. There are three main types of exophoric reference. The first type of exophoric or outward reference is used to describe generic or abstract situations in writing. It occurs when the writer chooses not to identify a person or a thing, but instead refers to them as abstract entities by generic words such as everyone, everybody, everything, and so on. For instance, everybody loves his own mother, or no one drives a car when he or she is drunk. The second use of exophoric reference is aimed to identify the referent which is not in the immediate context but is assumed by the speaker or the writer to be part of a shared world, either in terms of knowledge or experience when anaphoric or cataphoric reference does not supply the necessary information. 
In English, exophoric referential items are actualized by the definite article or demonstratives this or that. For instance, the government are to blame for unemployment. It could be odd if someone replied to this statement with the question of which government. It is assumed by the speaker or the writer uh, uh, that the addressee will know which one, usually our government or the government of the country we are in or are talking about. The same sort of exaphoric reference is seen in phrases like the sun, the moon, the director, the president, the queen, etc. The reference of which represent unique entities in the shared world of the communicants, that is, the writer and the reader. And finally, exophoric reference is often made to a shared world which is not directly connected with the context at the given moment. British popular newspaper headlines sometimes make references such as that dress, Queen's calls Princess D. Here? The reader is assumed to have followed certain stories in the press, and the reference is like a long-range anaphoric one based on intertextuality as it directs the readers to a certain text or text separated in time and space from the present. Another grammatical cohesive device is ellipsis. It is the omission of elements normally required by the grammar, which the speaker or the writer assumes are obvious from the context and therefore need not be raised. This is not to say that every utterance which is not fully explicit is elliptical. Most messages require some input from the context to make sense of that. Ellipsis is distinguished by the structure having some missing element. In face-to-face -face discourse, the omission of compulsory structural elements in the utterance is predetermined by the physical environment of the communication. For instance, if two people have to peel and fry potatoes, and one says to the other, you peel and I'll fry. The fact that peel and fry are usually transitive verbs requiring a direct object in the surface structure is suspended because the context supplies the object. In other words, structures are fully realized when they need to be. Therefore, ellipsis is a choice made by a speaker on a pragmatic assessment of the situation and not a compulsory feature when two clauses are joined together. In written text, the missing structural element is retrievable from the surrounding text, that's called text, in the way that anaphoric and categoric references are. For example, we meet anaphoric ellipses in the following sentence. The children will carry the small boxes, the adults, the large ones, where the main word we will carry is supplied from the first sentence to the second. In cataphoric ellipsis, the missing structural element is usually observed only in front place subordinate clauses and it can be easily supplied from the principal clause. For instance, if you could, I would like you to be here back at 5.30. There are three main types of ellipsis in English, nominal, verbal, and closer. Nominal ellipsis often involves omission of a noun headword. For example, Nelly liked the green tiles 
Myself prefer the blue. Verbal ellipses may cause greater problems. Linguists point out two common types of verbal ellipses, echoing and auxiliary contrasting. Echoing repeats an element from the verbal group. For instance, will anyone be waiting? He will I think. Contrasting verbal ellipses is when the auxiliary changes. We can see such a change in this short dialogue. Has she married? No, but she will one day, I'm sure. With clausal ellipses in English, individual clause elements may be omitted. Especially common are subject pronoun omissions, like does not matter, help so, can't help you, etc. Whole stretches of clausal components may also be omitted. For instance, he said he would take early retirement as soon as he could and he has, in the meaning that he has already retired. Another grammatical means of text cohesion is substitution. Substitution is similar to ellipsis in the fact it has on the text. It occurs when, instead of leaving a word or phrase out as an ellipsis, it is substituted for another more general word. For example, which ice cream would you like? I would like the pink one. In this case, one is used instead of repeating ice cream. Like ellipsis, substitution operates either at nominal verbal or clausal level. The items commonly used for substitution in English are one and once, for instance, I offered him a seat, he said he did not want one. Do, for instance, did Mary take that letter? She might have done. So, or not? Do you need a lift? If so, wait for me. If not, I'll see you there. And lastly, that's the word same. She chose the rose dot, I chose the same. It should be noted that both ellipses and substitution is a lot from the context. They proceed on the basis that omitted and substituted elements are easily recoverable. And therefore, natural in speech situations, where the high degree of contextual support is available. The last grammatical means of text cohesion we would like to focus on are conjunctions. Conjunctions make grammatical contributions to textuality in a specific way. A conjunction does not set off a search backward or forward for its referent, but it does presuppose a textual sequence and signals relationship between its segments. It is not at all easy to list definitely all the items that perform the conjunctive role in English. Halliday and Hassan have classified English conjunctions over 40 items, according to logical semantic types of relationship they can establish between textual segments. As a result, they offer the following functional semantic classes of conjunctions. Additives that include such conjunctions as and, in addition, further, and so on. Adversatives that comprise but, however, though, although, etc., causal conjunctions, because, consequently, since, as, for, and so on, and temporal, then, subsequently, after, before, etc. Halliday and Hassan focus on polysemantic nature of frequently used conjunctions, such as and, since, so, etc., 
whose meaning can be defined on the basis of contextual information. For example, we can observe the wide use of and in the examples given below. We are the meaning of this conjunction varies according to linguistic context. For instance, she is intelligent and she is reliable. In this case, the conjunction and has an additive meaning. Another example. I have lived here for 10 years and I have never heard of that pub. This time, the conjunction and has an adversative meaning and can be substituted by the conjunction but. Or, he fell in the river and caught a ship. In this case, the conjunction and has a causal meaning. And finally, I got up and made my breakfast. Here, the conjunction and expresses temporal sequence. Thus, we have discussed grammatical means of text cohesion and the mechanisms of their functioning in the text. We have analyzed such cohesive tools of the English language as anaphoric, cataphoric and exophoric references, as well as ellipses, substitution and functional semantic types of conjunctions focusing on their specific roles in text cohesion. That's all. Thank you for attention.